Hey folks, it's Ray with Taste Radio. Right now I'm on a call with Wes Henderson, the co-founder of Angels Envy. Wes, how are you? I'm doing great, Ray. Thank you so much for uh, finding some time to chat with me this morning. It's it's really exciting. I, I, I'm out of my COVID cave and I'm ready to I'm ready to rock and roll. Yeah, everyone's been in their COVID cave for a while, I think a little bit too long. So uh, it's good to see that you're uh, out and about. Although for folks watching on video, uh, your backdrop is of your distillery. Is that right? It is. That's a, a kind of a, a really nice long shot of the distillery from the back of the distillery towards the front. So, you know, if I move my head a little bit, you can see the stills up against that back wall, up against that back window on Main Street. And you have the the uh, the fermenters and, and the cookers like on each side of me there. And it's a, it's a great view. It's one of those, you know, picturesque views. And when the sun set, starts to set, it's almost got like a church like with all the big windows in there, the way the, the light filters in. It's a it's a beautiful setting and it's, it's a great place to come and visit. Yeah. How many visitors do you normally get a year, you know, COVID aside? I think this year we'll probably, well, this year, I don't know how things are going to end up, but somewhere around 80,000 visitors, I think, you know, we're, we're also undergoing a, uh, an addition to the brand home. So that may restrict us a little bit, but the end game is to increase our ability to, to, uh, to cater to fans of the brand as we expand and, but do it in a way that still keeps uh, everything personal or a very personal brand. But I'm really excited to, to see what's happening with the, with the expansion. Yeah, me too. So uh, I'm sure there are folks listening who have had Angel's Envy in their liquor cabinets, uh, you know, drawn upon the brand when they're ordering a cocktail at a bar. And when I think about Angel's Envy, I, I think about Manhattans. And I got to ask you, though, you know, where do you stand in terms of your favorite cocktail? Because uh, that might get a little, give a little hint in terms of where Angel's Envy is best used in a, in a, uh, in a uh, brown cocktail. First of all, I recommend that everyone listening has a bottle on their bar. <laughs> back up maybe on the kitchen counter and another one uh, somewhere that's readily accessible in the case of an emergency like a hurricane or, or a storm or anything like that. But I'm fortunate to be able to, to drink cocktails made by some of the best mixologists in the world, all around the world. So, you know, I, every, every day that I'm out in the field, I, I get to experience something fun, but I go back to one of the classics and, and some people say it's a very simple cocktail, but I don't think it is. I think it's one of those cocktails that can either be hit or miss. And, but with our bourbon, I'll drink an Angel's Envy whiskey sour. I like egg white for the texture. I think that just is a great way to top it off with our rye whiskey, which is a totally different animal. I like an Angel's Envy rye old fashioned. And, and some people think it's almost blasphemous to use the rye in a cocktail. But once you taste the rye in that old fashioned, and you do have to back off the sugar a little bit. Um, once you taste it, you'll, you'll never, you'll never go back to anything else. It also makes a really good Sazerac. So, you know, those are kind of the, the three places I go, but normally I will try stuff neat for the first time. I want to experience the spirit as it was created and how it was meant to be tasted. And then I'll go from there and go down whatever rabbit hole I, I feel like that day. Well, I think you've come up with some great uh, ideas for folks who uh, are listening and want to experiment with uh, Angel's Envy because I, I never would have thought of a, a whiskey sour. And that sounds pretty, the way you describe it sounds pretty amazing. It's really good. Wes, can you talk a little bit about the foundation of the brand what inspired you to launch angels envy with your dad looking back now actually looking at it at the time was probably a really crazy idea it really was a friend of mine had come to me who was in the spirits industry and he said west just out of curiosity you know your father's retired you know, world-renowned master distiller you've done a lot of stuff in business why have you never done anything with your dad and I, I told his guy named Jay Malty, I said, Jay, I, I honestly, I don't know the answer to that. I, you know, I, I thought about it, but I just kind of left it at that. But the wheels were turning and I flew up to Kentucky from Florida. I was living in Florida at the time to talk with dad and tell him what I wanted to do. I said, dad, I want to start this bourbon brand as a family. I think it'd be great for the boys to be involved. What do you think about doing that? And dad immediately said, sure. And neither one of us knew what we were getting into that I do know. We just knew that at that time we were going to give it a, a shot 
and and see how we could pull it off. So it was a pretty simple start. Now things got complicated quickly thereafter. Is that you know now that we've talked about doing this, now that we've agreed to do this, we have to bring it to life in a very competitive market. You know, we were going against some some huge companies. One of them, my dad used to work for, and you know, but you know, I think that we didn't know what we didn't know. So because of that, it, we weren't scared. You know, and we weren't. Uh, you know, failure really wasn't an option. We just we just said, look, we can pull this off. We know how to make whiskey. We've got some great ideas. Let's go for it. And that's really how it all began. It's amazing how quickly things can move uh, once you are inspired to do something and once you have the belief that will be successful. I don't look back on it enough as I probably should because we're so busy now. But if I think back, it's, it's like, you know, having six kids, it's the same type of thing. A lot of it's a blur because there's so much going on. But it's really good to go back and, and not just celebrate those those accomplishments, but draw inspiration on. Think about the things that that you know, like label approvals, goofy things like that, that we do now that we have experts to do and lawyers to do. Well, I did all that stuff myself back then. You know, if there was a pallet of product that needed to be moved from our warehouse to the producer or to the distributor, I arranged that shipment. You know, I'm on the phone with the trucking company, everything related from the day one of this brand as a group we did together. So now having that experience if there's something that comes up now involving those things, I'm like, well, hell, we did this. We know exactly how to do it. You know, we can we can work around it. And we did it on zero budget. We did it on a shoestring. So, you know, having those experiences, looking back on those experiences are real, it's really valuable information going forward. Absolutely. Now I mentioned that you're the co-founder of Angels Envy. You co-founded this company with your father. And I wonder. It, it can be difficult to work with family sometimes, from what I understand. Um, was there a, a real church and state kind of element to how you operated or how you founded the business with your dad? I, I think it's really hard to keep those relationships unfettered. I don't know if that's a great word or not. I, I would assume that some businesses may create that demarcation. You know, this is all business. This is all family. But I just don't know. Even if you can do that on paper, you still have the emotional aspect of it. So I, I really believe it's it's very difficult to separate the two. And Angel's Envy is really our life, and and so it's it's a it's a natural thing that we're talking about, you know, work and talking about innovations and talking about things that that we see on the horizon. We do it as a family all the time. It could be argued that maybe we should do less of that. But so far, it really hasn't been an issue where I think it causes conflict in the family. So, you know, it's it's and my dad and I always got together, uh, got along very well, you know, in all aspects of everything we did. So it, it wasn't really difficult keeping those together with some families. I'm sure you have to keep those things separate uh, because of the if you're not able to to deal with the emotional aspect of it you probably need to have that church and state separation. But, you know, we don't have those levels of emotion. So, you know, I mean, we have passion, but we don't have the, to the point of conflict. So it, it's worked out great. It really has been. There have been certainly moments where uh, I think more so with the boys, the brothers, you know, that competition between the brothers more than anything. So, you know, we have to kind of keep a, you know, talk about that and try to modulate that where we can. But, you know, I'm blessed to be able to work with those kids and they work together well. And I really wouldn't have it any other way. You're talking about your sons who are still in, who are involved in the business. That's right. I have six sons and the wow. four older, uh, yeah, I know. don't ask. I don't know how it happened. <laughs> um, one day we're boom, we have six kids and, and it really is a blur, by the way. I was talking about that with someone the other day. I was at dinner and the family had four kids and I'm like, I don't know how we did it. And that was two less than what we had, you know, little kids. Yeah. And I, I, that part of my life, I don't know whether that's uh, it, your brain blocks that out to protect you or, or what. But the, uh, the so the four oldest work at the distillery in different capacities, Kyle, Andrew, Connor and Spencer, they all contribute equally to what what we have going on in different capacities. So it's uh, it's really a, a great thing to see them at work and see them grow in the company. 
Absolutely. Uh, yeah, six kids, uh, especially six boys, I can imagine that can be a little difficult. I myself, there's 11 kids in my family, eight boys and three girls. So yeah, oh I, I understand what it's like to uh, to grow up in a chaotic household. <laughs> chaotic, but, but, but loving household. Well, that's it. I mean, that, that's exactly right. I mean, that, that's the way it's always been with us. It's very, it's always very supportive. I and mean, we're always laughing about something. Everybody's giving somebody crap about something. But at the end of the day, you know, you don't you pierce that family unit. And, you know, I, God bless your family. I can't imagine 11. Um, although, you know, once you've got six, what's, you know, five more, right? You just throw them into the mix. I'll ask my parents about that. Uh, you know, at, at, at six, does it really matter that you had five more or is it kind of the same thing? <laughs> Look, it's all about, it's like UPS. It's all about logistics. Um, it's getting the troops from point A to point B without leaving any man behind or any woman behind. Make sure they get fed. Make sure they have clean, uh, you know, socks and shoes. Yeah. And, you know, and beyond that, I guess you're good. Yeah. I just, I just think about, okay, so that's probably like an extra couple dozen eggs, Another gallon of milk, at least maybe two more boxes of spaghetti. But yeah, okay, it's all from the same store, right? It's just you know, it's all relative, man. Yeah, exactly. You and your dad both had uh, significant experience in the whiskey business prior to launching Angels Envy. Was that really helpful in getting the brand off the ground? And in what ways? I mean, certainly, Dad's experience, you know, being a Hall of Fame master distiller and forty years of Brown Foreman was was crucial, especially as we were crafting the direction we wanted to go with the spirit and, you know, and as I was doing the blends, creating the different flavor components, having dad's um, viewpoint and validation and recommendations was huge. I think that my experience outside of the spirits industry and building businesses and marketing and the other, you know, the other things I did were probably more influential than the time I spent in the spirits industry before angels envy. So it's those formative things, bringing them back in, coupling it with dad's experience and the experience of our partners that we brought in as well, who were extremely talented individuals in their respective areas. Those are the things that all, so I mean, it's kind of an odd answer to your question is, is it, it, once again, it's not so much my experience in the industry, it's the experience I gained outside of the industry that, that really, I think helped. So that and the bottle shape and a lot of other things we did, you know, just all kind of, and, and look, the other thing too, Ray, timing, timing is everything. You, know, you can't discount the fact that we came in 10, 12 years ago, right at the beginning, right at the cusp of what was happening in the bourbon industry. And we were fortunate enough to be one of the first in. You say you were fortunate enough, but was the launch of Angel's Envy timed with this explosion of, I'll use a term that has been used quite a bit, uh, craft spirits? Nobody knew. I mean, if anybody says that they did, then they're, they're they're crazy. I wanted to do a family brand with my father and with my kids, a small, and we use the word craft, craft gets thrown around a lot, and it means a lot of different things to different people. But a small batch, once again, another phrase that means a lot of different things to different people, but a family brand. We had no preconceived notions about how big it would be, how we were going to grow it. I don't think anybody saw, except maybe... For Woodford, when when Dad created Woodford and Owsley Brown and Brown Foreman, you know, and that's ten years even before that, ten or twelve years before that. I think Woodford was the first of many uh, uh, whiskeys that had been brought back from the dead, meaning a you know an old distillery refurbished, uh, you know, a small, really small crafted brand. So you know, so they, they had that, but truthfully speaking, I don't think anybody saw it coming. Now, the, the key, though, was is recognize that once we saw it, you know, um, but to say we planned it ahead to time it at this precise moment, like a train would get to a certain place at a certain time. I, I, I certainly can't take credit for that and say that we did. But we did recognize when we were in the midst of it, what we were in the midst of and, and how big of a renaissance this was going to be and how this was our moment. You know, it's, it's, it's being able to seize the moment when you find out that that's the moment. That's what I think makes an exceptional business or a business exceptional or a business that's just, you know, average and just does okay. Seizing the moment. Absolutely. I, I think, you you know, you nailed it. It's, you know, a lot of folks say that luck is the intersection of timing and opportunity, um, but executing upon that timing and opportunity is critical. Um, and, and one of the ways that Angel's Envy was able to stand out and really appeal to a lot of folks is the bottle shape. 
Um, you mentioned this. The, the bottle shape has become iconic. Uh, what went into that process? What went into the design process for that mold? Um, and how how did it was how was it intended to fit with the liquid itself? The design process of the bottle was relatively um, simple once we knew the direction we were going with the name. You know, we loved the concept of the angel share. So everybody involved in the project and some of the creative people that we got involved in the project, you know, who we did a deep dive with them into just the history of bourbon and the process of making bourbon and everything related to bourbon. Everybody seemed to really like the angel share component of the business. For folks who are not familiar with the angel share, could you explain what that means? For sure. The angel share is what evaporates out of the barrels as they sit in a warehouse. And we lose three to 5% a year to evaporation in Kentucky. That amount is different depending on where you, what the climatology is. But three to 5% a year goes into the air. We say we're sharing that with the angels. So uh, just the notion of, of that is just a great story by itself. And we wanted to incorporate that into um, into the brand. So when we started thinking of the angel share, we we love the, the thought of angels, and we think of angels' wings. I I believe when we think of angels a lot of times, and I'd always wanted something on the back of the bottle, and, and really it could have been anything on the back of that bottle, depending on what we decided the brand was going to be about. I just like being able to look through that bottle and see something on the back. I just think it's a cool look. So, and we minimalized the decoration on the front of the bottle so you could see those wings as much as possible. So, so I was fixated on having wings on the glass and then the shape of the bottle conformed to the shape of the wings. It was that simple. There were two versions. There was a version that was a little taller, a little more slender, which I didn't like um, because I felt like it was just too tall and slender. I don't know any other way to describe it. I wanted them to make the shoulders a little more broad, which is what I said to the design team. So they really just kind of pushed the bottle down a little bit, made the short, made the, the shoulders a little more broad, and that was it. So we only did two Lucite models of, of the bottle design. The original one I just told you about that was the, the thinner one, and then the final uh, Lucite model, which a Lucite model is a pre-production hard plastic model of a, of a bottle. You don't have to do loose sight, but I, I'm very, I'm very uh, tactile. I wanted to hold that bottle and see it, you know, the physical bottle as much as I could before we decided to do a mold. So that then we were off to the races. You know, once we keyed in on that and we knew we wanted the wings, we knew we wanted that bottle shape. It was risky. Nothing like it. Nothing like it out there at all. And it was scary back then, you know, beginning of the craft movement, you know, we're going up against the old traditional bottle shapes, the old traditional companies, but we just dove in, you know, we, we said, all right, we're going to do this. You know, we've got a bottle. It's sexy. It's, uh, it's got a lot of, it's got a lot of weight to it. It's super premium. And we just felt like it was time for that. Well, the bottle certainly stands out on a retail shelf or on a, on a back bar, um, and I think it communicates uh, something special. It communicates something in some ways small because you just don't see that bottle shape anywhere. At least you hadn't seen anything like that bottle shape anywhere else, particularly within the whiskey segment. And speaking of small, I, I think, you know, you started out as this small craft distillery and um, I think people knew you as a, uh, sort of specialty producer, if I can use that term, but you grew so quickly, you, you, you scaled so quickly in terms of retail and distribution. How do you scale small? If I'm correct, how do you scale small while still developing the brand in a way that's going to, uh, expand it, uh, expand awareness and sales to whiskey consumers? I mean, the brand definitely grew quickly, but we, we grew in a very restrained way. We never outkicked our coverage. We never went into markets. We resisted the temptation and I was the worst about it, by the way. Somebody would call me from God bless the state of Wyoming, which doesn't sell a ton of whiskey, but you know, the 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 liquor control board called me and it's West we really want Angels Envy. God, we'd love to have some. We're shipping maybe two cases a, a month there, but but still, you know, that's an example. I wanted that presence there. 
And, and, you know, anybody that called, I wanted to put Angel's Envy in their hands, but our team was a lot more disciplined than that. And, and that an extraordinary amount of discipline. And I, when I talk with other brands that are in growth mode, I, I beat this point really hard is that you cannot outcook your coverage. You've got to grow in as controlled of a way as you can. You can only, you only got to launch one time. You know, you don't want to have go doing, going back and doing a relaunch because you put it someplace that you weren't ready to put it. It's just, it's just not the right way to go. So it was a very controlled, we had, we made sure we had people in the markets before we launched. I would personally go launch these markets with the distributor. We had to identify the right distribution partner. We were fortunate to be able to select the distribution partners we wanted to work with. And we had some fantastic partners. So, you know, we resisted that urge to get it everywhere. And believe it, I was the one that wanted to get it everywhere. So my team had to strap me to a chair sometimes and, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and gag me. So I don't, you know, say, Hey, you can have it. Now, the next phase is, is that, you know, how do you, as we get even bigger and we're in all 50 States now, or international, uh, you know, how do you keep the magic? And how do you keep that feeling that you created from the very beginning? And, and you have to be careful in doing that. You know, we still do the same things the same way now that we did at the very beginning. With respect to production, it's on a little bigger scale. All the process is the same. Uh, the family, we're all still uh, 100% vested in well, first of all, the creation of innovations, the monitoring of the quality, you know, to me, and we mentioned the word craft earlier, I mentioned the word craft, you know, I get asked a lot, what is craft? Is it a number? Is it a number of bottles? Is it how big your still is? What is craft? And I've, I've come down with my definition of craft is that, that craft is a mentality. It's, you can be craft and be 500,000 cases a year. You can be craft and be 5,000 cases a year. It, it's how you go about running that business. And, and, and you know, and I, we run it the same way that we ran it from the very beginning. So, but it is a challenge. It always is a challenge that, you know, we talk about it all the time. We recognize that and you have to preserve the magic. You really do. Part of preserving the magic uh, does come from maintaining a sense that you are still a limited kind of production distillery that you are still producing the whiskey in small batches. That being said, I think the perception might've changed a little bit given that the company was sold a few years ago. I don't feel that way. I don't even know if people know that the company was acquired a few years ago, but I, I have a feeling that probably played into the decision-making process when you decided to um, sell Angel's Envy. Can you talk about that process from an emotional and rational standpoint? You know, what went into that decision? There's always a danger and an acquisition of losing the magic. Big companies are notorious for screwing up small companies. You know, you you bought this really nice little new toy and, you know, everybody wants to play with it. Everybody wants to put their own name on it. And, before you know it, somebody breaks it. <laughs> the, the, the relationship and the acquisition by the Bacardi family has been incredible. The family is amazing. They're the largest, you know, privately held spirits company in the world. Uh, they've been making rum for, you know, what, 160 some odd years now and doing it very well. They recognize the family aspect of Angel's Envy. And the last thing in the world they wanted to do was to get in the way of what had made us successful. Uh, they were there and continue to be here to support the business any way possible. And, and they've funded these incredible expansions, our, our distillery, all these things in order for us to, to keep doing things the way we were doing them. And it also frees up time for us to do what we're really good at. And that's innovation and monitoring the quality of, of, of our ongoing uh, endeavors. And, and really, the, the dollar figure was less important to us than how the business was going to be continued and the family involvement in the business going forward and our ability to continue to do what we had done, you know, so well. And one thing Facundo Bacardi said to me, you know, as at, right after the closing, he said, Wes, you know, I want you to continue to do what you have done and don't let anybody change that. And if anybody tries to change that, 
you come and talk with me. And, and I took that in a very heartfelt manner. I've never had to make that call um, because everybody's been fantastic. But, but that just reinforced to me how important it was at the highest levels of the company that, that we do what we do well. And we're a proud member of the Bacardi family. What, what an amazing portfolio of brands. And the company, especially post-COVID, has, has, has done uh, some amazing things in the industry. And I'm just really super happy to be part of that family. Well, it sounds like Facundo Bacardi really understood the, the heart and the essence of Angel's Envy because the brand has been known for its limited edition and experimental uh, efforts, and you've led those efforts. When you are considering innovation, how do you balance the need for more scalable concepts versus ones that are uh, one-off or brand building? I think a lot of that is still evolving. It really is. You know, we have three, well, we have two SKUs that are out there all the time, unless we're out of stock or people, well, we're out of stock because people buy them too fast, but, and thank you for that. Um, we, we have our bourbon and we have our rye whiskey. We also have our cask strength version of our bourbon, which we release once a year. The other special releases, there's really not a cadence to those. We release them as, you know, as they're ready. And as we feel like, you know, I've always felt like I don't want to say anything unless I've got something that's worth saying. So by saying something, I mean a, a new release or a special release is saying something. You know, I always want to be part of the conversation, but I only want to be part of the conversation if it's if it's contributing to the, you know, to the industry or, or helping the brand or whatever it may be. So we're really still evolving that cadence of special releases, but I like that notion. I, I never want to see five or six different Angels MBSKUs on the shelf at one time. Now Eventually, somebody may disagree with that, but I, I don't really see that happening in my lifetime. But you know, I, I like having our core brands out there, and and we look, we could add another one one of these days. Who knows? But the the unique nature of our special releases, and all of which have been received as being some of the top spirits in the world every year they're released consistently, that adds excitement. That gives friends of the brand something to look forward to. And so I, I kind of like that model, which is still growing as we speak. So, you know, I, I wish I could say we had a calendar to show exactly when everything's coming out, you know, but we really don't. And, and truthfully, also, it's ready when it's ready. You can't rush quality. And, you know, you can't, we've never been asked to rush quality. We never will be asked to rush quality. And we'll never take something to the market before we believe that it's perfect. It's not finished till it's finished. And we use that a lot. And it, because not just because we finish products in a secondary barrel, but, you know, we're not going to meet some arbitrary deadline to have something out the door because we want to meet a goal or a number or whatever. That's such a wonderful statement. Uh, you can't rush quality. Do you think that's specific to the whiskey business or do you think that would apply to any consumer product? Well, I, in a way, it, it probably applies to any consumer product, but particularly in the spirits industry where time is such a big component. I mean, it, it is possible to put products out. You know, in some cases, products come out in less time than I think that they deserve to give them the best possible chance to be the best they could possibly be. Most often that's done for economic reasons. Uh, some of our craft producer friends, you know, you've spent all this money on stills, all this money investing in creating a new brand. There's this push to get things out the door. In that push, I think sometimes things get out that could would be much better if they waited a little bit longer. Um, so time is, without a doubt, very, very uh, specific to, to our industry. One of the things I learned about you, or I guess two of the things that I learned about you, Wes, uh, prior to our interview is that you're a volunteer firefighter and also a certified pilot. Let's start with the firefighter uh, aspect of what you do. I, I think you received a couple of text messages about uh, your firefighter service, or I think it was your son. Is your, is your son also a volunteer firefighter? So there are three of us that are state certified firefighters. And, you know, I'm kind of winding that particular aspect of my life back and doing some other emergency services stuff because I'm getting older. <laughs> 
I'm 55 now, you know, going into hey, you're still a kid. Bucks. You're still a kid, Wes. Come on. on. <laughs> I'm a kid and so am I. I've had eight, eight knee operations and I'm going into a, a house that's on fire. Um, it, it has a <laughs> okay, totally, that might be a problem. <laughs> it has a different perspective to life. But, um, so three of my sons are already um, uh, certified firefighters. And then uh, one is in the uh, fire recruit class now. So there are, um, so yeah, so several of us are, are involved in the fire service in one way or another. And I'm, like I said, I'm moving over to more emergency services stuff, it, I, you know, and I just got a text, like, like you said, a little while ago, an alert for my son's department. So he had a, he had a, a structured fire run. So I'm always paying attention to where they're going to, because we're at different departments and, and very often we'll see each other on the same scene, you know, because the departments cooperate with each other, they're all in the same County. So we're always working together, but it's not unusual for me to see one of my kids out on a run that I'm making um, or, or, or vice versa. So um, it, it's, it's really a, a joy to be able to work with them there as well. And it's definitely been a challenge during COVID as, you know, first responders have really been asked to step up and, and, and put ourselves in, in, you know, more in harm's way. Uh, than normal. I mean, you're always in harm's way when you're out doing a lot of the things that are done in emergency services, but during COVID, it added another dimension to it. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm, re I'm really proud of them. Um, I'm proud of our team who made hand sanitizer that my department used during COVID, you know, to protect ourselves. So they're, they're great kids and they really give back, you know, really give back to the community. So it, it's, it's a very, uh, it's, it's very gratifying. Yeah, it's it's definitely an honorable profession and, and one that you should be proud of. Are there certain aspects of, of being a firefighter that um, you can apply to being a business person? I mean, are there any lessons that you can draw upon from that service that make you a better leader in, in for your company? I think always the team aspect of, of working in emergency services is, is, is so critical. You're working around people that you have to trust completely. Is that person literally able to save your life if it needs to be saved or, you know, or whatever the, whatever the emergency might be, you know, and, and certainly I've been in emergencies where, you know, that, that are that, that, that dangerous. So you want to be surrounded by the best possible people. So in informing my teams, I think in terms of who do I want to be in the foxhole with, um, because I'm going to be there with them. I want to make sure they've got my back as well. So teamwork is, is so important. Um, operating in an environment of, of controlled chaos, business can sometimes be like that. You know, you're, it's like being strapped to a rocket ship a lot of times. So I think emergency, it really has been, this business has been, has been like that. So I think experience in emergency services allows you to prioritize, to, you know, to live in those moments of chaos and control them. Um, I also look at things, I don't know if this is good or bad or not, but a lot of times I'll look at things in, in, in terms of how they can go horribly wrong because I see it all the time. So, you know, not to the point to where I'm pessimistic or, 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 or not willing to take, take risks, but it means you're always evaluating the situation. You're always evaluating how something can go sideways and how to immediately react if that happens. And, and once again, that was a good lesson during COVID, especially at the beginning. We had to rapidly react to quickly evolving situations with, with, a, with a pandemic, with our people, with closings, with, you know, uh, you know protecting our, our team, all those things. So I know it's a long-winded answer to your question, but all those things together, um, you know, I see that with people from the military that work in business. I think there's a very similar mindset as well. Um, so, you know, there, there are some, there are some great things that that service brings to the business. Um, you know, maybe sometimes a dose of pessimism that's not, not great, but I think that's, that's unavoidable when you're confronted with, uh, you know, a lot of the things that we're confronted with, but I'm the eternal optimist. You know, I really am. I, you know, we're going to figure out a way out of this. We're going to figure out a way to do it as a team. And we're going to come out on the other side stronger than, than, than how we went into it. Yeah. And I don't think any of that is really, you know, could be construed as pessimistic. I think it's more preparing for the unknown or preparing for the inevitable in some cases. And I think that might also apply to being a pilot too, right? Is, you know, when you're in the air, unless you're the most experienced pilot in the world. And, and even then, I, I think there are things that could go wrong that you just have to be ready for. Well, I mean, you're always training as, as, a, as a pilot, you know, and it's very much like emergency services. You're training for, you know, when things go sideways, you know, what do you do? And 
unfortunately, like you said, there are some things that even the best pilots on the planet, you know, if your wing falls off, there's really, you know, you're, 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 you know, there's really not a lot you can do about it, like a catastrophic failure like that. But we've seen a lot of examples of pilots land planes that, that nobody thought they would ever be able to do. So um, I think that, that one of the lessons I bring back from flying to, to business is that, you know, flying is a very technical function. It's uh, very reliant upon procedure. It's very reliant on checklists. It's very reliant on a high degree of technical competency and bringing that into the business and bringing that into the spirits industry, which we are a scientific business. We are a technical business. Those things are, are helpful. But many of those things, like you mentioned, in, in flying and emergency services are very similar in how you train and, and how you prepare. But, you know, being a pilot, especially a private pilot, is more of a, of a solo type of thing, even though you, you may have passengers. Um, I think it's less of a team sport than working in emergency services. But I, I enjoy doing all of those things. I really do. And, you know, I think it keeps my mind as sharp as it can possibly be. It, you know, uh, right now, you know, I can't imagine not doing them, but eventually I got to wind down, right? I don't know. I mean, if it keeps Maybe your not. mind and body healthy, why not keep doing it? And I think yeah, sometimes, the, I'm sorry, the, go mind, ahead. the mind is willing, the body sometimes not so much. Um, you know, I'm starting, I'm only 55, but after as many knee operations as I've had and everything else, but but it's, it's all good. You know, I am buoyed by getting up every day and, and, and walking out the door to meet amazing people who love bourbon, who love Angels Envy, who want to hear the story of Angels Envy. I have a team that is the best on the planet who support everything I do, who really make things easy for me. You know, I'm like, you set them up, I'll knock them down. And they do. And most of the time, I think I do. So it's, it's, it's a true blessing to be able to do what we do and do it with the people I do it with and the hospitality industry, you know, who have suffered more than anybody, I think, through COVID and who we all really need to support. And look, I mean, I'm doing an interview with you, you know, I mean, that's cool. I mean, there's interest in what we're doing and uh, I'm very grateful for that. And I'm really grateful for you saying that. I think, you know, you're right about the hospitality industry and that it might be easy for some people to forget that so many folks were out of jobs and that they were really struggling and restaurant owners and small businesses were in a very, very challenged environment for the last 12 to 15 months. And um, I hope that we can all support them in, in any way we can and every way we can going forward. And so thank you for, for saying that. And I'm so grateful that I had this opportunity to speak with you, Wes. Um, it's really an honor for me. You know, Angel's Envy is a really remarkable brand. And having this opportunity to, to sit down with you and talk about it has been really great for me. So thank you. Thank you so much. My pleasure.